What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast brought to you by Windows 11. I'm Scott Baer, along here with Tori McElhaney, and to quote the Lion King, Pumbaa most specifically, wow. our trio's down to two. Oh, that was so good. Here, here's what I was going to do. I was going to be like, you know, on the episode of New Girl where they think Nick is going to die, and they're, st- <laughs> wow. they're at the bar, and they're like, and Winston's like, this is a sad song. I was like, that's kind of what this feels like uh-huh. without Chris being yeah. here. Uh, normally, there is a chair over here occupied by our dear friend and colleague, Chris Rim, who... Uh, did, did his last podcast last time and so upsetting. then he took a brief sojourn in <laughs> Portugal and now he's going to go to a little paper called the uh, New York Times which is what I say every time I mention his uh, career path from also here on honestly I saw a comment the other day that said Chris had the best voice of the podcast and I 100% agree with that I think so too I think my voice is incredibly annoying and <laughs> And wow. I know, I do. I think it's so annoying. And so I honestly very rarely do I like listen back to the podcast because I'm like, oh gosh, I can't hear my voice. Well, there there will be no more sultry tones of Chris Rim. But yeah. we are, as we move through the summer, we are going to start having guests on the pod. Yes, Get very some uh, fresh energy in here. But that's all for the future. Another shameless plug before we get started on, on what will be an OTA primer podcast where we delve into everything that the Atlanta Falcons are going to do over the next two and a half or three weeks, including, I believe it's 10 OTAs that officially started th- th- their first of 10. Uh, on Tuesday, and they run through a, a man- mandatory mini camp, if I can say that right, in mid June, and then they go real quiet until training camp. Um, but before we get to that, just a quick promo on June 3rd, clear your calendars, <laughs> go down to Mercedes Benz Stadium to watch the Falcons OTA practice. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. And then after the practice, we're going to do a live episode of Falcons Final Whistle Woo! with me, with you. And who knows who else? And a player. <laughs> yeah. We right? don't know which player. But right. It'll but be a, player. a player. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> it could be anybody from your imagination. Maybe it's Grady Jarrett. Maybe it's Lorenzo Carter, who we're going to get to later in this podcast. Uh, it could be one of the new NFL draft picks. You're going to have to show up to find out. And also, there will be time for you guys to ask questions, too. So all that stuff mm. is going to be fun. June 3rd, Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Be there or be square. Uh, before we get to all that coming up next week let's focus on what's coming up right now Mm -hmm. and that's the off-season program is starting to ramp up a little bit now are they putting pads on no they're not so there's still elements that this isn't a full training camp period but it's the first time that we get to see the veterans and the rookies Mm -hmm. interact uh the first open OTA where we can all take lots of bad cell phone pictures and (laughs) tweet them out is Thursday. So stay tuned for lots of content uh, coming up about that. Tori, kind of what are you expecting? What do you kind of want to see from like from this OTA period when there's so much roster turnover heading into 2022? I think that's the main thing. I want to be able to see this group perform together. I know, you know, OTAs is, you know, it's not training camp. OTAs is really the first chance that we get to see this group together. And I think that's what I'm most looking forward to. It's not necessarily that I want to see them go out and compete like how they will in training camp. I just want to see what this team looks like together. I want to see what this offensive line looks like all lined up together. And I'm not just talking about the, the, I mean, the A team, however, the first team, however you want to say, I'm talking reserves I'm, I, and I want to see how these receiving weapons actually look out on the field all together I know we've been talking about how tall they are how big they are how they actually coincide and then also just some pairings that I'm looking forward to seeing I'm looking forward to seeing these draft picks go alongside some of these veterans I'm excited to see Rashawn Evans and Troy Anderson work side by side you know it's that kind of stuff that we've been talking about for months but now we actually have the first opportunity to actually see these groups working together. Yeah, and we are going to to dive into all of the players that we are interested to kind of get that first look, that that first glimpse of in a Falcons uniform, some of these draft picks. And, of course, we're going to have a lot of quarterback talk, as mm-hmm. you would expect uh, for a team with Matt Ryan now on the Indianapolis Colts and Desmond Ritter, the third-round draft pick, and veteran Marcus Mariota in – 
flowery branch here getting ready to kind of lead that offense but before we do all that a big thank you to our sponsor microsoft windows 11 the official operating system of the nfl and the atlanta falcons the all know windows 11 is here to bring you closer to what you love like this falcons final whistle podcast learn all about the awesome new features of windows 11 at windows.com so i mean let's start with the most popular position obviously Offensive line? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Let's go straight to that right tackle uh, position <laughs> battle and kind of go from there. Uh, the quarterbacks coming in. This will be the first, I mean, rookie minicamp doesn't count because Matt no. Ryan wouldn't have been there anyway. Right. So this Thursday will be the first time the media will be in front of a full squad Falcons practice without Matt Ryan there. In over a decade. In over a decade. Yeah. Um, 13 plus years. Yeah. That's going to be different. Yeah. Different isn't bad, mm-hmm. but it's going to take some adjustment, right, for the for the new quarterbacks coming in, for the offensive line working with new guys, for the coaches, for so many different things. Matt's footprint and his legacy here is huge. It will go on through the history books, right? But now that they're turning the page here with OTAs, look, they're going to make mistakes. There's going to be pre-snap this. There's going to be inaccurate throws. So when you see the tweets come out, right? Let's not panic and let's not put a hierarchy of where Marcus is and where Desmond is and where uh, Felipe is, right? But these quarterbacks, these quarterbacks can move, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what kind of command they have and how they're able to kind of run this offense, knowing full well that, that, that Marcus is probably going to be the alpha as we start the offseason program. Yeah. And I, I think that's not something that is unknown. You know, like I know a lot of people are talking about Desmond getting some reps and everything, and he's going to get his reps. I mean, I think we're so far away from the start of the season that to talk about a day one starter and who we think it'll be, is kind of doing a disservice to the process of OTAs and training camp and what this coaching staff can learn about Marcus Mariota and Desmond Ritter. So, I, I, But I do go back, even in saying that, I do go back to what Arthur said the night that Desmond Ritter was drafted. He was like, you know, Marcus is the veteran in that room. He's played a lot of NFL football. That matters. He's played in an Arthur Smith system. That matters. Um, I think that they will still be learning about Desmond Ritter throughout the next three-ish weeks and throughout training camp. Um, and it, they'll still be learning about Marcus, too. I'm excited to see – just these guys out there I I know that goes back to my very first thing but like I I really am excited to see how Desmond pushes Marcus and Marcus pushes Desmond I I do think that this pairing is going to be beneficial for both guys and and I think that there's sometimes you, you can't say that about every competition in every position group but I do feel like you can say that about these two guys because I think they both and this is a theme that we've talked about over the course of the last few months is like this team has something to prove. I think this quarterback group, Marcus and Desmond and Felipe too, they all have something to prove. Desmond ha- wants to prove that he should have been a first round pick. Mm-hmm. Marcus wants to prove that, you know, he was a first round pick and he deserved that. And he honestly, like just getting back into a starting rotation is, or not even a rotation, a starting role. That's what he's trying to prove, that he is that guy. He still is that guy. And so that, to me, is very interesting. It's a very interesting storyline when you're heading into OTAs and then training camp and then, you know, the first of the season. Yeah, and when you look at it, I I was asked in the most recent Bear Mail that came out on Monday who my biggest – surprise was going to be this season like a bold prediction in may Mm. type of thing and i said look you can go ahead and alert freezing cold takes and that's fine and when he if he doesn't win the starting job you can rub in my face but i said marcus mariota Mm -hmm. i just have a feeling that because of the environment he knows the 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 scheme and because desmond ritter is here to push him Mm -hmm. desmond ritter i thought said it so well during his last press conference where he basically said, look, that that he looks up to Marcus, he that they have similar skill sets, that there's a healthy respect for one another, but they're going to push each other. And Desmond Ritter, for as much as I think that they'll like working together, I think Desmond wants the number one job, oh, yeah. right? But I, I think that's a good environment for Marcus to be in. He's not being handed anything. Right. If he's going to want to prove that he's an established starter, 
in what may be his last opportunity to do so, Mm. right? That he's going to need to be at his best early and learning and then performing and uh, producing, Mm -hmm. right? So I think this is a good environment for him. I still go back to the fact that he was the number two overall draft pick for a reason, right? Right. Like not every number two overall draft pick works out, Mm -hmm. but I think that he has the skill set especially when paired with the skill players here that he and Cordero Patterson in the backfield, I think there's an opportunity for him to thrive. We're not going to know about that for three or four months, but back to your point is that, that this is a good opportunity to see these guys run around, to see what it looks like with a truly mobile quarterback Mm -hmm. and to see what Arthur Smith is going to come up with to accentuate these guys talents. Um, So I think it's going to be fascinating and look, quarterback is going to be a, a hot topic. Yeah, we're going to talk about time. this for so long. I mean, this is going to be. I think that's fine. I do too. I mean, it's fun because we haven't been able to say that for right? over a decade, and that's nothing against Matt Ryan. Having an established guy at quarterback that you trust is a luxury, and it is great. Now, the Falcons don't necessarily have that luxury anymore, and it's going to be everybody's going to want to know about this position and how Desmond Ritter looks, how Marcus Mariota looks, how they're connecting with Kyle Pitts and and Drake London and et cetera, et cetera. All of that is going to be a topic of conversation until a starter is named. And even then, even then, even if Marcus is starter day one, I think we're still going to be talking about Desmond Ritter and his progress throughout the course of the season as well. And I I think because he wasn't the number eight overall pick, he was the number 74 overall pick, there's no um, assumption or commitment to him being the long-term franchise quarterback. So at first we have the who's going to be the day one starter question and how do they fit in like in into this offense question and how is Desmond Ritter doing over the course of the year question. There's also a bigger one. Mm -hmm. I know Arthur Smith is – focused on 22, doesn't like talking about 23. But the bigger question is, are one of these guys, Marcus Mariota is only 28, Mm -hmm. are one of these guys your long-term answer at quarterback? And that's going to be an overarching question Mm -hmm. for a long time heading into 2023 when they may have to make a new decision Mm -hmm. on the quarterback or they may feel really comfortable with who they have and they can focus on other things. So I think for all those reasons, it's going to be fascinating to watch these guys and dissect it. And I'm sure the coaching staff will like roll their eyes at us sometimes and we'll drive them nuts because we're going so far into it, Mm -hmm. but it's such a, you need it's so important yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so look we're not going to have an answer tomorrow or thursday when we start you know tweeting stuff out but it's all small pieces of information on a bigger puzzle so when you're when you're reading the stories on atlantafalcons.com when you're on social when you're seeing these little videos and snippets of action right store it away add it all up make an informed opinion down the road as opposed to quick yes i'm lecturing (laughs) well Honestly, do you know how far that lecture will go on Twitter? It will not go very far. It will at not all. go very far. No, at all. I mean I think it, you're absolutely right. But at the end of the day, everybody wants to to consume mm-hmm. immediately. That's what the game of social media is. You consume immediately, make a snap decision and a snap judgment, mm-hmm. and you're telling people not to. Right? They're going to be really upset. They're going to be like Scott. Like, can we chill with? Let all us the, have our phones, Scott. I know uh, all this kind of high and mighty football as academy academia academia thank you there you go Woo. uh so marcus mariota desmond ritter felipe franks especially those working with the first unit are going to be throwing to a basketball team <laughs> the the core of pass catchers here which if you subscribe to this podcast if you don't please do has been a major topic of that wide receiver was a major need. Well, they went out and spent the number eight overall draft pick on a guy named Drake London, who, in addition to being a pretty awesome football player, averaged 29 points per game as a high schooler in basketball. If you haven't seen his 540 dunk, do it. But he's 6'3", and Auden Tate is 6'5", and Kyle yeah. Pitts is 6'4". 6'4"? Yeah. Right? That you're... That's a big Cordero group. Patterson six two. Six, I mean, I guess we can include a six two guy in there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, and but the other thing I, I think about when I think of all these guys, Drake London, huge catch radius. Mm-hmm. Kyle Pitts, massive wingspan, huge catch radius. So you can be on target or maybe a little off target and still get a completion out of these guys. I think that's going to be important for this offense as they start to kind of get in sync. 
But Arthur Smith, of course, said, hey, look, I, I don't <laughs> discriminate yeah. against Alameda Zacchaeus. No, he said, I don't discriminate under wide receivers under the under six foot. Which is nice. Of Which is super nice of him to say. And then he goes on to say, I love Alameda Zacchaeus. One of, it's one, one of, of his my, favorite professionals. I want to ask him why OZ is his favorite. He said he said that a few times. He has. I, and and. That's nothing against OZ. Like, we've talked to him a few times. I enjoy talking to him. And he's made some clutch plays. He has, 100%. But for Arthur Smith to say, this is my favorite professional, my favorite guy to coach, intriguing. Mm -hmm. I will be asking that at some point over the course of OTAs and or training camp. Be on the lookout for it. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. And to see how this group comes and evolves, right? Because there's so much new here. And there was so much new that needed to come in Mm. because Calvin Ridley is out for the entire year. Russell Gage is in Tampa Bay. Frank Darby, as we've said a bunch of times, was the only is the only returner with at least one reception Mm -hmm. outside of OZ. Outside of OZ, at the time he was tendered, he hadn't signed his. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, that 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 would have garnered a couple of YouTube. Oh yeah, one hundred percent for sure. I got your back, bro. Thank you. So. As you look at this wide receiver core, I think there's intrigue there. That this is this is another group where you thought major need. Can they take care of it all in one year? And now I think that's still a major question mark. But how is that group mm-hmm. going to come together? Expecting a first year wide receiver to be like do what Justin Jefferson did mm-hmm. is pretty difficult. Right. I think because it's so complicated the uh, position, but. W- going in to see Drake London against veterans at, at, at rookie minicamp. He's against, you know, tryout cornerbacks and it's half speed. And now it's still no contact, but at least it's going to be maybe AJ versus Drake right. or Casey Hayward versus Drake. Those are the types of matchups that even if they're not truly physical, that I really want to, uh, uh, to see play out. Yeah. And I also, I've noticed this when I sit and I write stories about the Falcons offense, just over the, the overarching, idea of the Falcons offense I tend less to write wide receiver core and just receiving weapons yep because I think you can't put Kyle Pitts with Drake London and and with uh Brian Edwards and he's not he's a tight end and Arthur Smith I think would say he's a tight end first and foremost that's our tight end and and so I think even though he is gonna be one of the most important receiving weapons same exact thing for Cordero Patterson. He's a running back, but he's one of the most important receiving weapons. That, I think, is the scope of what this offense wants to be, is that they have, and it comes up all the time, the versatility to keep defenses on their toes, not knowing what they're going to do with CP, not knowing what they're going to do with Kyle, not knowing what they're going to do with Drake. I think that is what makes this Falcons offense and Arthur Smith and the entire offensive coaching group I think that's their goal is they want to be a confusing offense and and so when you're talking about wide receivers and how important it was that they rebuilt that position to me it's more it's it's more than that it's Mm. more than just the receivers or the wide receivers it's all about these other pieces as well so the uh, six round tight end John uh, Fitzpatrick had his first rookie minicamp press conference um the other week within five minutes of him taking the podium with a microphone in front of him he said a phrase he said positionless football yeah already already we're here he'd only been there in flowery brands for like 48 hours and he'd already heard the term positionless football which i think goes to what you're saying is that they you're right to to say all right well kyle pitts can only be involved in this because he's a tight end or you know what i mean Mm -hmm. to bring their positions in. I've been asked a lot, well, how much is Cordero going to play in the backfield? Do we need to put an RB by his name? No, it's just, why? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I know Arthur Smith is very, like, <laughs> he gives he gives you a hard time, or not you a hard time, mm-hmm. but he gives people a hard time about depth charts, like, yeah. during the season. And it, he just kind of is like, Meh. Like, depth charts aren't a thing. It's mm-hmm. just kind of like, we know. It, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, so who so who cares about who's starting? If Kyle Pitts isn't out there the first snap, it's that package. Like, you know, it, it's it's very interesting to me how they view what they have versus what I think traditionally we view lineups and how they're used. And and we're gonna see skill players moving all over the place and to forget about Brian uh Edwards 
in the basketball team. He's six foot three. Right. Also. Yeah. He's, he's going to fit right in, but in order for the skilled players and the quarterbacks to do what they do, you need a pretty good steady starting five yep. uh, up front on the offensive line. It could be that the offensive line looks exactly like it did last year. Yeah. Caleb uh, McGarry at right tackle, Chris Lindstrom at right guard, Matt Hennessy center, Jalen Mayfield left guard, Jake Matthews left tackle. It could be, but it could. It's very possible that that gets jumbled up somewhat, and I think that that's going to be again. We got to wait till pads get on yes, before yeah. we know what's going on there. But just. I think offensive line is going to be really intriguing to see not only who lines up where, mm-hmm. but how they operate with a mo a truly mobile, mobile quarterback. quarterback. Yep. And how how they operate it, I think, is going to be fascinating because there is some competition there now. Well, I think I've said this before, and maybe I said it on the podcast, or maybe I wrote it. I'm not sure, but I am very interested in seeing this offensive line in training camp. I yeah. think that group, maybe more than any other group on this entire team is the one with the most competition. I don't think that anyone, it, anyone's position is safe. And I think Arthur Smith has said that. Like, we want to ha- – he talks about competition and having competition all the time and finding these nasty guys up front. O- outside of maybe Jake, because, you know, they just extended him for three years, and outside of Chris Lindstrom, who, you know, they just picked up his fifth-year option – I, I wouldn't put money down on anyone. I think right. there's going to be a significant competition, maybe not now in OTAs, but when we get to training camp, I was actually talking to um, Coach Ledford, who's the offensive line coach, a couple of days ago. Well, actually, no, it was around the draft when, when they took Justin Schaefer, and I asked him, I was like, how excited are you to get to training camp? And he was like, ha. Ah. You know, you could just see, like, the excitement. Like, oh, yeah, I want these guys to go, like, beat up on each other, essentially. And he didn't say that, but I'm paraphrasing. Like, but that's what you want from these guys. You want to understand who you have. And, and offensive line is such a interesting position because we're talking about position battles. But collectively, as a group of five, that's really important, too, how they work together. There's a lot of moving parts when it comes to the offensive line. And I know – offensive line doesn't sell it's not a sexy topic like any of that kind of stuff but it is going to be so important when we're talking about what happens over the course of OTAs what happens over the course of training camp and when we get into the season and you have to have answers at some point before you kick the ball off on September 100 right because we saw the Falcons offensive line last season kind of evolved during the course of the year after some er- after some early struggles because Jalen Mayfield was playing right tackle a lot. They, they, they didn't have a set starting five. So I think as we move through the uh, offseason program, as we get into training camp, we start seeing where some of these new guys are lining up mm-hmm. and who's working with first units. I know our, our drives Arthur Smith nuts. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, to, to see how this whole thing is is going to shake out is really interesting. And it's not like we're talking about Drake London or we're talking about Desmond Ritter. We're talking about offensive line play. I know. But I think if without the offensive, without the offensive line play, yeah. there won't be a lot of highlights to talk about. No, so, you're not going to see Marcus Mario to take off for, you know, five yards if this offensive line can't block for him. 100%. Um, now, the, the Falcons defense – defense Woo-hoo. If, if you're a falcons defender and you're listening to this podcast one thank you two you probably feel like a little slighted <laughs> we've been talking about the offense the whole time and whole now time. we're like running down to the end of it i'm like oh p.s also, there's a whole other side of the ball that's been completely remade yeah um so when you get to that side of it um there's a lot of new pieces there yeah who are you most excited to see over the course of these OTAs mm-hmm. uh, lineup, anybody new, anybody old that you want to? I mean, I I don't know how many times I've said this, and I'm going to say it again. I feel like this podcast has just be, been me reiterating all of the points that I feel like I've already made. but Which is right about where we are. It's time for some action, and the OTAs exactly. are finally going to give it to us. Yes, finally. Um, Casey Hayward and AJ Terrell. I am so excited to see that pairing. Like, and I know that in OTAs, it's different because you don't have the pads on. You really don't have them going 100 miles an hour down the sideline or anything like that. You, you don't have them bumping all the way down. I mean, that's – I'm just excited to see those two because I think that, that those two change what Dean Pease can do in front of them. And, and I think that's really important. I think having Isaiah Oliver back 
is going to be really important. I I really want to see what he does this year. I know he's on a one-year deal um, because I believe, and this, again, people might think this is a hot take, but I do believe that he, for the majority of the t- his time in Atlanta, has been playing out of position, and it wasn't until the back half of the 2020 season when Raheem Morris moved him to nickel and then Dean Pease kept him there that we really saw what Isaiah Oliver could be. And I think – you know, now he's coming off of ACL. That sucks. You know, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Right. Like, it's not good. But you have this one. He's on this one-year prove-it deal. He has A.J. Terrell beside him. He has uh, Casey Hayward beside him. And then you have, you know, your deep safeties. You have Richie. You have Jalen Hawkins. You have uh, Eric Harris is coming back. I mean, I, I think that this secondary with – AJ Terrell and Casey Hayward kind of being the anchors of it changes things for Dean Pease and what he can do. I think that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, and when it comes to secondary play, you will probably get a clearer picture of what they're doing and how they're operating at OTAs and things like that than you will the uh, guys up front. But that's not going to prevent me from saying a guy that I'm fascinated with to see not only in these early OTAs, but over the course of the entire offseason and training camp. And that's another Georgia Bulldog on the the team, uh, Lorenzo Carter. He's a guy that he's had five sacks before. He's a big, strong guy, intriguing talent. He was one of the early, early early-er free agent signings, Mm -hmm. I think. And you actually covered Georgia when he was there. Give us a little uh, scouting report on him. Like what? What can I expect? What can you expect? Yeah, so I really enjoyed my time covering Lorenzo Carter. It was the year that it was him and Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle, and they decided to come back. I think that was the bit that was the big storyline of that year is when they went to the national championship, lost Alabama, but we won't talk about that. But, <laughs> but you know, one be uh, Baker Mayfield in the Rose Bowl and then goes to the national championship. And it was that year that they decided to come back. They all could have gone into the draft, but they decided to come back. And I I think covering Lorenzo Carter in that year, he, I mean, it was just the picturesque year, even though they didn't win the national championship. But for a guy like Lorenzo Carter, it was, he, it was just like his length always caught my eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about the, he, the one moment I think that every Georgia fan or college football fan will remember is in that Rose Bowl when he blocked the blocked that kick and in double overtime and and that was just you saw his link there mm-hmm. like you saw you saw why he is the player that he is and so and I think that he, talking to him when he first got to Atlanta he was talk or I guess Flyer Branch mm-hmm. but you know um, but he was talking about you know his he felt like he was finally coming along and then he has the Achilles tear. And then last year was all about just trying to get back into the form that he thought. And then I think you saw in the last five games of last season, what he's really good is really good. What he can be and what he hopes to be. I mean, he had like a sack in every single, uh, Every single game the last, like, five weeks of the season had, like, a lot of tackles for loss. Like, I mean, it was a significant time for him. It's showing, and I think that's why he was willing to take a one-year deal, is showing teams that person that you saw for those five games, that is who I am. Not what you saw before when I was trying to get right with the with the Achilles, all that kind of stuff. It's this guy. And so I think – I'm excited as well to see what he can does, especially because you know he's going to play a big role because that outside linebacker group is so young. They have so much. So to, young. So, so young. Like, I was talking to Ted Monachino, who's the outside linebackers coach, and he was like, you know, it's nice because you can kind of build them and morph them into what you want because you think Ade Ogundeji is a second-year guy. You have um, Arnold Evichetti and uh, D'Angelo Malone, two rookies. Mm-hmm. These guys are young. They have a lot that's going to kind of be thrown at them in this year, particularly having Lorenzo Carter there as a guy who really wants to prove, like, I am the guy. I think that's – it's going to be good. I, I think it's it may not be significant sack numbers good, but I think for their per, all their personal growth, it'll be good. Yeah, and, and they're going to need him 
as you pointed out, to play a major kind of stabilizing role. That means good against a run. That means creating havoc in the backfield, something that they struggle to contain, even slightly mobile quarterbacks. So we're looking for improvement from this defense, knowing it's kind of a multi-year project. But there's so much new here from the quarterback spot all the way through the defensive backfield. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be tough for us to remember the right numbers for the right guys. You know? I know. Everybody's so different. I think uh... – I think Rashawn is, Evans is 54, yeah. and that was Foyer, and I'm just like, I don't know who I'm Gonna looking flashbacks at. Flashbacks, yeah. Sure. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how these guys come together for the first time. So be sure to stay tuned to AtlantaFalcons.com for all of your Falcons content needs. There, there will be lots of good stuff. And uh, again, rate, review, subscribe to the Falcons Final Whistle podcast to our friends over at Falcons Audible. They're awesome as well. And please come down to the stadium and say hi. It yeah. would be so much fun. Bring questions. Yeah, we're super excited to yeah. finally be able to interact directly with, with fans and stuff like that. Uh, You'll get to see our faces in real life. Real life. Um, and we're going to do all that on June 3rd. So come yeah. on down. Can't wait to see you. And we'll talk to you soon.